Who was in this room yesterday? Raise your hand. All right, wonderful. Well, thanks for coming back. Appreciate it. So similar to yesterday, uh, I invited a few friends to come on stage with me and share some stories. And today we're gonna talk about craveable brands. What does that mean? How do we create something that's craveable and how do we speak to consumers in the way that they need to understand so that uh, we can gain their advocacy, we can grow our brands, grow our companies. So that's very high level what we're gonna talk about today. And, um, and so what I'll do is I'll just kind of introduce each of my friends here, give a little bit of context of, of how we know each other and what they do, and then I'll have some, some fun questions for you. Sound good? Great. Super. Okay, excellent. Um, so Mara and I met, what, about a year and a half yeah. ago, yeah. your chief fragrance officer of mm -hmm. Pura. And uh, what really stuck out to me when I left that little like, lab that you have there was this idea of creating a brand presence or a brand uh, touch point with scent. Like, talk, us, talk, talk to yeah. us about that. How does that work? What is that? Well, it's pretty amazing because our brand is a representation of our marketplace. Mm -hmm. And in our marketplace, we have many premium brands. Yeah. So this is what sets us apart, differentiates us from everybody else in this airspace. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times, um, air care in a fragrance house where I come from is created on the consumer product side of the business. Mm -hmm. So this is the Airwicks, the Glades, the Febrezes, nothing wrong with that whatsoever, but it was taking um, the co-founders, you know, Bruno Lima and Richie Stapler's vision of what they wanted our marketplace at Pura to look like. Okay. So it was a step above. So we fall somewhere between like the luxury mm -hmm. category and the mastige. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's in a exciting area to work in because we get to push the envelope and yeah. trailblaze in this space and in turn, a lot of the luxury brands want to work with Pura because of where we're positioned. Okay, so as you're working with luxury brands, anthropology mm -hmm. yes. or athletes or... Yes, well, I'm asking right here. Right, perfect, right? <laughs> so as you're, working, as you're working with celebrities and you're working to develop a scent that is an extension of their brand. Yes. Like what, how do you do that? Oh, it's amazing. I have the best job in the world. Okay. Because what we do, again, we bring like a fine fragrance approach into air care. So when we're either, there's two ways that we uh, create for Pura. Mm -hmm. One of them is what we call translation. So mm -hmm. people are familiar with like say volcano because they've used the candle for years. Then we take it and we translate it for liquid electric. The structure of the formula is completely different than what you use in candle. Yeah. But what we really, really love to do is create signature scents. And you know, we do that for Disney uh -huh. and we do that for Becky Owens and a plethora of other uh -huh. accounts and uh -huh. stay tuned because there's many that are coming in. So when we sit with the brands, of course, we need to be spot on, not only from a hedonic standpoint, uh -huh. meaning it really, that fragrance has to resonate with what they want to say, yeah. Yeah. okay? And then we work with them, we work with the product teams, we work with the sales teams, we work with everybody, and then bring the perfumers in, because we work with every major fragrance house in the world, right. and, and the perfumers, and we, I speak the language, yeah, absolutely. you know, because I've done it for 25 yeah. years. Yeah. So it's really exciting when you're creating something new for this mm -hmm. space, and if I can just like throw in, just for an example, you know, we did a project with Kenneth Cole, and there's two more fragrances that are launching in July, Kenneth smelled with us. Wow. So it was so cool because, of course, I have New York roots. He's a New Yorker, uh -huh. all of the above. So you presented kind of we concepts presented to him, everything. ideas, they, they, smells. Yeah, absolutely. They presented to us, and then we took their idea, what they wanted to say with yeah. their brand. And I think all of us realize that it's the belief in the brand. Yeah. You have to believe what you are saying for people to believe that. Absolutely. So then all of a sudden, you know, Kenneth is like, I'm smelling with them. Yeah, and good. we loved it. We, it was good. a big love fest. Of course, he's sarcastic. He has my sense of humor, you know, as a New Yorker. <laughs> and it was really a lot of fun, but it's a creative collaboration and partnership unlike any other yeah. that I've ever participated in. Fantastic. So exciting. Fun Thank to be able to present yeah, those absolutely. You know, concepts and be like, yeah, that is you. Yes. That is an extension of yes, the Yes, absolutely. Oh, that's wonderful. So Ashley, Ashley and I um, have worked together at Stance. You guys know Stance, an apparel company? All right. Yeah, let's hear it for Stance. <laughs> Um, so Ashley and I have worked together on a, on a repackage design project, and so we've had a, a few conversations and opportunities to talk about how to build a craveable, lustful, meaningful brand. And prior to Stance, she led marketing at Sunbum, 
and prior to Sunbon was Elf Cosmetics. And so she, you know a thing or two about scents and yeah, signature scents. I was gonna scents. say, we're gonna talk after yeah. this for sure, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so scent is one touch point to yep. a brand that's obviously very important. You know when you smell a Sunbum product that it's Sunbum. You know when a little kid runs by that they're wearing Sunbum, right? Yep. What other touch points are there? How do you begin to create these, you know, these touch points, visuals, like this messaging so that it builds a brand that people care about? Yeah, absolutely, great question. I think, um, and before I get started, I should confess that yeah. I have since left Stance um, to join a startup, so I'm just gonna put that out there. Um, but I think, uh, you know, the first thing that comes to mind for me is all the brands that you see that I've been a part of uh, design has really been the look, the feel, the touch, mm -hmm. all of that. You know, scent is such an important part of it, but I think, you know, really thinking about, for us as consumers even, what we feel. Kristen talked about it this morning, and I loved that is that all of those pieces, the details that you put in, mm -hmm. um, each of the brands that I've been a part of, we really consider that and, and put a lot of energy into that. Even color, it's one of the most remarkable things mm -hmm. is that color really draws something out of people. Um, an example of that is at Sunbum, you know, the, the wood grain, the yellow uh, is kind of the familiar when we launched into hair care. The, the question, and as we were trying to build that, was to say, well, we can't just do that. We've really got to think about what, what's the clean feeling in, yeah. in your bathroom? How do you want to think about color and, and even just on the shelf? Um, mm -hmm. What does that look like, both the physical shelf and the, and the uh, digital shelf? So I think there's, there's kind of the, the look and feel and all that entails. And then really it's about the human truth mm -hmm. that is at the center of the brand when you think about craveable brands. Um, I learned that from, uh, I started my career on the agency side, and Jeff Goodby, who's the man who came up with Got Milk, so yeah. everyone knows him, um, I've been lucky to have him as a mentor, he said that, that everything comes down to that human truth moment, that it's something that people can connect to because it feels relatable, it feels like there's something, even if you can't put your finger on it. Um, for some, Sun Mom, it was really that nostalgia that we all feel when we're at the beach, mm -hmm. um, that we want to go back to, that let your hair down kind of feeling. Um, there's, there's different ways that brands tap into that, but it's that, that universal kind of emotion, yeah. I think is really important and investing in that. And then I would say just consistently bringing that through mm -hmm. um, is probably, and I know, I'm sure we'll get into it, but. Oh, so, okay, so double clicking on that consistency. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think I've probably bought every Sunbum product that there is, yeah. right? And, and we've got purple dripping down from the blonde hair and like all, yeah, yeah right? Yeah. So, and, and that's great, we love it. Um, but as Sunbum grows or, or grew, and you wanted to stay consistent and you wanted to stay loyal to your ethos, like was there anything that you said no to? In other words, what if Sunbum could launch this product? Yeah, already? that's a really- And you're like, ooh, I don't know that that- Well, I'll, I'll tell you actually, just staying on hair care, because I know it's most known for sun care, um, but there's hair care, baby care. Yep. I still love all the brands I work for, so I'm a huge ambassador of them. Um, but it was interesting in the hair care space. Um, can anyone guess what the number one product is in the hair care space? Hairspray. Thank you, hairspray. <laughs> so hairspray, huge business, yeah. absolutely huge business. And so that was actually one of the biggest debates we had internally was, okay, we know if Sunbum comes out with a, with a hairspray, mm -hmm. it's gonna absolutely dominate, mm -hmm. like we knew that. Yeah. But it was fundamentally opposed to the brand ethos, which is beach lifestyle. You, you know, it's much more about that, you know, kind of just carefree. We're not spending four hours in a bathroom getting ready. Instead, we want to be out surfing or living life. Yeah. I mean, that's, so what we decided was we weren't going to do it. And so we walked away from the opportunity. We definitely had interest from our retail partners. And instead, we came up with sea spray. Yeah. And so that was what we went into. And then, you know, we did evolve over time when I was there as well, but it was really just that making sure that we felt like we weren't compromising mm -hmm. because of a lot of what you said, if you start to compromise, yeah. your consumer base is gonna see right through that. Yeah, and so sure. I think that's probably maybe so that the best was the impetus of, yeah. of the sea spray. Which... Yeah, well, it, it was like one, and then we kept going back to it. Yeah. So it's why the sea spray, and then it was like hair, and then the like sales, hairspray, the sales hairspray, like, and then um... it was like, yeah. <laughs> And, it, and you know, I, I, don't, I believe that um, the brand has still not launched that since I've, I've yeah. left. But Good, yeah. wonderful, thank yeah. you. Yeah. you know, one, of the, the early, the, one of the things that you said at the beginning, you spoke to design, right? And Jake, I was at, um, I was at Crate and Barrel with my 10-year-old daughter, Zoe, and which Kristen was like, they were like, she loved her. It was amazing, yeah, they were best <laughs> friends. And so we we're at Crate and Barrel and we were looking at everything and, and, um, and, she, and she said, I'm like, well, these are all coffee products. And then she said, well, that one's designed. 
That's just how she explained it. Like, and she was pointing to Fellow and the product line that you have in, in Crate and Barrel. And so we told her the fellow story and like, oh, well, Jake and I have known each other for 10 years and Jake was my intern at Enlisted. And he's the one, Jake is the one who literally wrote a business plan for us and then prepped us to go on Shark Tank. Like that was your job for three yeah. months. And at the end of it, Jake came to me and said, I have an idea. Like, do you guys want to partner on this? What did we do? We launched Fellow. Yeah, we yeah. launched Fellow. <laughs> it's good to see you. Good to see we, you. We too. haven't aged one year. In Not the at all. Uh -uh. We look it's, exactly it's, it's the same. It's incredible, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, what did we do? Um, so um, I have a personal passion for coffee and product design. So mm -hmm. Fellow is just the mashup of those two things, um, which in a way is an unfair advantage as an entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm designing for myself. Uh, and I'm obsessive about what I want to design and what I want to use every morning, yeah. right? So we, you know, we, we took that, that love and passion and rolled it into, uh, into Fellow. Yeah, and Jake was one of the, the few clients over the last 15 years of running Enlisted where we would present concepts, ideas, and he would come back. And even when it got into the final like, color material finish, you know, detail, detail points, where we're like, okay, this is good. This is, this is the direction we should go. One of the very few clients who pushed back and said, actually, you know, could we get this radius just a little bit tighter? Could we get this, you know, this piece like this way? And so it was awesome because he was an extension of our, of our team. Like it's one of those collaborative projects that we ever, we've ever done. Yeah. And it's been successful. How, within the category, like you fellow going into coffee, who, which is a category that takes itself pretty seriously. How did you know how to differentiate yourself in such a crowded space? Yeah, so, um, so I, I worked in coffee before I started Fellow, so again, going back to that, that real love. Um, and what I noticed back in 2007, 2008 was that there's a disconnect between the quality of coffee that these third wave roasters were roasting and the equipment that people were using to brew with at home. So it was trying to close that delta was basically the original um, thinking for fellow, right? And then when I thought about the brand, like, you know, and we talked a lot about this, is especially coffee can be pretentious, right? Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to be approachable, right? And I want people, I want to grow the market. I want to welcome people into specialty coffee. Like the name fellow is to be seen as the guide, to be seen as your friend in the pursuit of great coffee. Uh, I mean, there's even a little bow tie on our yeah. logo, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's just like, hey, you know, this isn't complicated. Come join us. Yeah. Like, let's do this together. And I feel like you've really done that within the category in San Francisco with your store there, right? Where you've created this lab that's just open to your competitors. It's open to Blue yeah. Bottle. It's open to consumers coming in and creating together. Yeah. Right? So it's like, I would say it's part of your ethos. <laughs> yeah, it, it, completely. Uh, and. Part of that is I'm a big believer in that um, as an entrepreneur, you need to wake up every single morning and say, how do I get closer to my customer, mm -hmm. right? So we have a store in San Francisco. It was our second office. So we, we had eight people at the time and the back half and the front half was a retail store. And every single day we would walk out and talk to customers. Yeah. Um, and man, we learned so much from that to the point of, I remember spray painting a product white and then putting it out on display. And then I told the store associate, let me know at the end of this week how many people brought that white product up to the cash register. That's so cool. <laughs> that's amazing. And then we launched white, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, you launched white and that's what Blue Bottle brought on, right? Wasn't that the collaboration? We first, first the white and then they did a Blue Bottle fog gray. Right. Yeah. yeah, so amazing. That's great. So, all right, so let's talk about the consumer, right? Because oftentimes, an operator, especially a, a CEO or a founder, oftentimes is an operator, right? And they've got logistics and 3PL, yeah, all of this lined up. And it's like, that's great. You need all of that as a foundation. Um, but really, if the operations, the brand, anything else is at the center of the focus of the, of the company, I found that it's just gonna be far less approachable and far less successful in comparison to when the consumer is at the center. So, Ashley, would you kind of lead us in that? How do you get to understand your consumer and what are some of your secrets in doing that? Yeah, that's, that's great. I'm glad you're established. I think that is critical, is having them at the center. And, and what's interesting is, to Jake's point, getting out there is probably the first thing I would say. You know, in each of the brands, whether it's, you know, in the case of Sunbum, it was we put so much effort into the surf shops and going and actually talking to the shop kids um, in standing in the, in, you know, just the store experience observing. Um, same thing with, with the other brands that I've worked for. Um, but I think that also you can do it easily even from your, you know, smartphone. You can look and just make sure you pour over the comments 
that people are leaving. There are so many amazing nuggets that you can find in there. Um, the other thing too is just make sure, and I think this is something that I, I really learned from a, a former uh, e-com partner of mine, is that you know, instead of thinking customer service, think consumer engagement. Like just completely shift that in your mind mm -hmm. because that's the reality is those people are, I consider within even marketing world, it doesn't matter where they report to, they are the most important group to me really yeah. because they're hearing everything like you said. And so if you really stay open and you listen, but you find all of those touch points, you will be shocked at some of the insights that mm -hmm. you can gather from them or just the little things. Um, and then exactly as you said, just experiment. Yeah. I think that Elf is an amazing example of that. You know, their .com is... Um, Elf.com is, is really an incubator. Uh, mm. So every product goes there first. And most, I would say at this point, succeed. But I remember at the time when I was there too, it was we knew something was going to fail. We could fail fast. Yeah. And then we could move forward. And then by the time we would roll it out to other channels, we kind of, we saw that. We experienced that with yeah. us. Um, but I think just asking questions, and, and I really can't champion enough uh, the, the consumer engagement team, yeah. um, which I'm sure for mm -hmm. both of you as well, it's important. Mm -hmm. so, so talk to us a little bit about the, um, the site, right? So it sounds like you were testing products essentially on the site. And there's, yeah. were these just renderings that you were putting out there? Did consumers know? No, we were produced. Test? We were producing. I mean, we've done, we've done also, you know, I've done a lot of A-B testing in terms of just concepts, and, yeah, and especially course. with pricing. Uh -huh. I, mean, I think that's a really great tactic thing to do is yeah. um, you can put up two prices and just start seeing really, um, mm -hmm. you know, just the elasticity of, of what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, it was real products. It was, it was kind of like just taking a leap. Now, that's a very specific bu business model yeah. that we were able yeah. to lean into. But it really was the belief of do small runs. We owned the manufacturing line, so we were able mm -hmm. to do that more effectively. Okay. But I think that even, you know, just right now, as part of a startup, there's products that we're making hypotheses around which ones are gonna really fly and just being really smart. Yeah. I would say that marketing, I think you also, as any marketers in the room, please get to know your operations team mm -hmm. really, really well mm -hmm. and really learn the process and really start to create that nimbleness um, because I think that's the other thing is just testing and putting it out there, uh, being able to then react to it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you may have to sit through the um, initial run of inventory, mm -hmm. but at least then you can you can stop it in its tracks. Absolutely, kind of thing. Amazing, and that's got to be such a, a fast pace to be able to do that and introduce product. Yes. Wonderful. It was insane. Yeah, I'll bet. Good times. <laughs> yeah. I'll bet. So, so Mara, I I shop a lot. Um, I shop online a lot. <laughs> And when I'm looking at a product online, you know, the photography, the rendering, yeah. animation, whatever, like, I design products, so I know, I, you know, I know what materials, I know what that's going to feel like, look like, and how I'm going to interact with it. I have no idea what the hell to do with scent. Yeah. Like, how do you market scent on a dot com, on a website? Yeah, absolutely. It's a tough one. Yeah, it's and like And we're working impossible. on smell vision now, so okay. <laughs> to, be, to be continued, but... <laughs> Yeah, it is a tough one because what we've used in the past, especially in this space, is a retail, of course. Uh -huh. We have, you know, our packaging and design is there. Yeah. Our fragrance descriptions. I mean, if you have ever been on the Pura website, we actually have a fragrance quiz okay. that you could take, and it determines, like, where you might lean, and you could always pick up the phone and call us and speak with us. But one of the exciting things that we are doing right now, and it's just, like, about a month away from launch, is we have a scent sampling program. Great. So we are, okay. have, we are using what they call scent peels. People in the fragrance industry probably know what that is. So it's on a card. Mm -hmm. You have the description of the fragrance on it, and then you lift the little tab, and you're going to get the hedonically correct rendering of what you're going to purchase online. Wow. Okay. So this is going to be, I think, That's game, a game changer. changer. Mm -hmm. Yes, game changing for us because it's something that we haven't done before. We've talked about it for a while, yeah. but we're doing it now, and it's really, really, really exciting. And let me just add a little bit of that. You know, Hope, my, my um, director of fragrance evaluation, I, she, she and I worked with each other for 25 years in New York City. So it was probably harder getting the hedonics, the character of the fragrances correct on the sample cards yeah. than it was probably even for the liquid yeah. electric unit yeah. because... Well, the medium changes the scent. The right? medium changes the scent, and it's also, again, yet a different form formulation, mm -hmm. you know, that you have to use, but it's a similar to, like, when people open magazines mm -hmm. and have scent strips. Yeah, of course. If that doesn't smell good, they're not going to buy the product. Yeah. Yeah. So we really painstakingly took our time, did all of our top fragrances, and what you're going to see is every fragrance that Pura launches from now on is going to have 
the send sample cards. Amazing, and that launches this month. It should be like in a month. They're pretty, they're finished now. That's but yeah, huge. This, yeah. That's really so it's big. really exciting. And because I'm thinking about the consumer insight that you were working off there, and it, I would imagine that it goes along the lines of, you know, what's a barrier to entry? Like, what's the yeah. barrier to people clicking and purchasing right. these products? And it's probably the, I don't know, $20, $40 price tag of these bottles Correct. to test. Absolutely. Right? And that, that's kind of risky for the consumer. It is, it is risky, but, you know, we have so many different programs. Again, and I love what both of you said, because we're all in the same wavelength. It's approachability. Yeah. We want to be in everyone's home, as I'm sure you do, too. Okay, and it's making this whole, you know, this is, we're combining literally uh, art and science. For sure. You know, we've airlifted a fragrance house in the middle of a technology company. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I remember just a quick story when I came in and met Richie and Bruno at my old job at a fluke, by the way. And then when I came here, you know, I started speaking this language that was so familiar with me, and all the investors and tech guys were like, what? You know what I mean? Because it was different. It was yeah. different. But I had to learn the tech side of it to make sure that marriage works together. Okay. And the formulations, the ingredients, the technology, as we do iteration after iteration, go into car devices, tabletops, uh -huh. everything that we're uh -huh. doing, that has to marry correctly. Yeah. And everything needs to work for the consumers to be able to resonate with. Yeah, absolutely. And oftentimes we think of the product as the product, like yes. the physical object, right. which I know you have an object yes. that goes on the wall. But it sounds like your product is far bigger than just the yes. physical product. Your product is the product experience. Completely. That every touch point, all Everything. of these things coming together. Everything, and that's the exciting thing about having the experience in my title, which I love, because I get to help with this. Yeah. It's through scent. Scent is memory. There's probably not one person sitting in this room right now that doesn't have some memory associated to scent, whether it be your grandmother, your mom, whatever, even yeah. bad scents. Yeah, oh yeah. You, know, you just relate to that. And one of the things that we always talk about inside, especially with everything going on in the world right now, and um, is we don't have control over a lot of things, mm -hmm. but we do have control over the way that we create our space. Mm. And we want to be part of that fix, yeah, part of that yeah. comfort that we bring into people's homes mm. to make them feel good. And that's really what designing, I could go on and on about talking about the technical things about how you formulate and everything, but it, it, when it comes to the end of the day, it's how does it make you feel? Yes. Does yeah. it put a smile on your face? You don't need to know what's in it. We mm -hmm. have it there, mm -hmm. but how does it make you feel? Yeah, absolutely. I love that, right? Because that's that, uh, that emotional connection it, between completely. this thing and completely. this human. Absolutely. Right, and oftentimes we forget totally. that really it comes down to the emotion, absolutely. And binding those together. Absolutely. And scent does such a good job of creating a, a space of, you know, it can be energizing, it can be soothing, it can give a sense of belonging. Like completely. it's really powerful completely. Of, of what it can do. Completely, and we also want to have variety for everyone. Yes. You know, we're, we're never gonna go to somebody going, you gotta like this fragrance, never. We yeah. want you to find something within our marketplace that you're gonna love. Yeah, it's so good. Okay, so I wanna dive a little bit deeper into creating this emotional connection. Yeah. When we think about craveable brands, things can look good, things can feel good, things can work good, that's all great, right? But then you still have the dollars, you still have your purchase decision with, okay, how much does it cost, right? Like how quickly can it get to me, especially in e-com? Um, so I know that there is this kind of trifecta of decision making, but talk to us a little bit about how Fellow and the brands that you're working on, Ashley, and then Mara, over to you, how are you creating that emotional connection? Me first? Yeah. Um, so I took up surfing about four or five years ago. I'm originally from Minnesota, I live in California. I surf every now and then, and I might stand on one wave every trip. Yeah. Right? Um, I didn't buy a surfboard or a wetsuit, I bought the ability to walk on water. Mm. A customer's so not buying a kettle or a grinder from us. They're buying the ability to brew cafe quality coffee at their house, yeah. right? So I have to look at it like that, mm -hmm. and I look and focus on the job that the customer is hiring, hiring us for. Mm -hmm. And that's not to heat water, yeah. right? Yeah. So it, There's it, lots of things that can heat water. So when I and the entire team can look at it through that lens, like I think that's how we get to emotion. Yeah, 
Fantastic. And how do you stay top of mind? Like, let's say, you know, somebody buys the kettle, somebody buys the grinder, somebody buys the mugs. Yep. But then, does it just stop there? Like, how do you engage? Yeah. So our, our mission from day one was to help people brew ridiculously good coffee at home, right? For the first eight years, that was through product design. Mm -hmm. Staying really close to the customer, one big insight was beautifully functional products without great coffee and the knowledge to use those tools are just paperweights, right? So our big focus over the last two years has actually been on content and education. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you use these tools? Um, and the coffee itself. So we've, we've moved into, you know, we have a marketplace on our, web, on our website. We do weekly coffee drops to our customers. We're now selling thousands and thousands of pounds of coffee every week to those customers who bought the kettle and the grinder mm -hmm. and the drinkware and the brewer, right? That's so it's completing great. that story for the customer. And are those your brands or are you bringing in other brands that you respect? Respected roasters. Uh, oh, I, I'm, I am not the best roaster in America and never will be, but yeah. like I can find those best roasters in America. Okay. Um, so we actually leaned on, so we sell through cafes and roasteries. Um, we have been for the last nine years. We leaned on those relationships and said, mm -hmm. hey, let's actually introduce your coffee to our customers. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So you knew with, with Fellow, you kind of, maybe from the beginning or maybe as a leadership team, you knew that you needed to focus on coffee products and creating this ritual and a reason and, and desire to use the products. And then it seems like even though you may have a financial or revenue opportunity to launch your own fellow branded beans and grinds, but you've decided not to. Why? Because we can't be best, right? I think we can be best at product design. Mm -hmm. I think we can be best at education and, and content, mm -hmm. but I don't think we can be best at roasting coffee. There are just too many incredible roasters yeah. around the world. So true. Right. And our customer, will, they want variety, right? Yes. Like they, they don't want just, here's fellows, you know, blend of the month, right? Yeah. They, they want to say, Jake flew to Iceland, which I did two, two months ago. Amazing. And <laughs> sourced coffee from a roaster in Iceland. Wow. And then brought that back to our customers in the US. That is so cool. So cool. I love the collaboration, right? Just saying, hey, we're all going to rise from this. Let's bring in the best of the best and deliver that experience to our consumer. Yeah. Very cool. So, Ashley, mm -hmm. this, this intangible, invisible, emotional connection between consumers and brands, yeah. how do you speak her language? Like, how do you begin to create that? Even from the beginning, like, you know, we've already talked about Elf, but, like, there's a lot of startups here. You know, so if there's somebody here who's, like, I, why I'm starting this thing, mm -hmm. well, how would you advise them? Yeah, I think it's interesting that, um, you know, there's two, two things that come to mind. One, it sort of informs the other. The first thing I would say is um, going out and authentically, in a very real way, into the subculture that you are trying to bring your product to is really important. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, because you're going to learn so much, and you're going to be able to build, much like what you were saying, build with. Is so I think were you out surfing thing. and hanging out at skate parks? So we're going to, yeah, stands? that's exactly right. I actually did pick, yeah. try to pick up surfing because yes. I was like, I've got to understand what right. I'm doing. I'm All not right. good at it. I've we stood can up twice. Out there together. Yeah, it's like fine. It's, <laughs> it's fine. It's an ongoing goal for me. Good. Um, good. No, but I, but I will say I think Stance is a great example of it, of just, you know, I mean, all of these brands, obviously, and, and I have a tendency to go uh, because I think I'm inspired by it, but is that, you know, with Stance, you know, even if you look at it, it's real yeah. that the uh, relationships, the meaningful relationships that were cultivated in the action sports world mm -hmm. with basketball, with, you know, these different sports, and, and because of that, I think you can you can go in, start really learning the nuances so it becomes the if you know, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think those are some of those subtle pieces that really do start to create that believability yeah. that, again, Kristen said it earlier this morning, is like all parents in the room, we were like, uh-huh, yes, yeah. uh-huh, we yeah. totally can relate to it. And so that then informs the voice. Yes. And so even though we've talked about you know, the design, and, and I'm super passionate about it as well, I think that often the voice of a brand sometimes mm -hmm. gets forgotten of how critical that is. And you know I'm going to make the plug because I did it the first day, day yep. we met. Um, but this book, and I really encourage everyone, I don't know this woman, but her book, uh, Why She Buys, is such a brilliant read. It is, yeah. It's mind-blowing, actually, to me. Um, because it's all about the difference of women and men and mm -hmm. how we're wired biologically mm -hmm. to the size of our hippocampus. I mean, just really nerdy, awesome yeah. stuff. Um, but men tend to be drawn by visuals. Women, 
its voice. Yeah. And so just there's, there's pieces of that that I think are really important of that connection. Back to we've talked about scent, we've talked about design. I think the voice and just creating that story with people and, and having that resonance um, is it. And then I think it's, you know, a lot of what I do is try to create experiences. So mm -hmm. when we talk about surf, it's not just the surf shops, it's, sh it's showing up at surf events and, and sponsoring kids and getting out there and, and just getting your product in the hands of people. You yeah. can do that through influencers. You can do that through local communities. I mean, I just, I can't stress enough, probably the most powerful marketing tool at the end of the day is word of mouth, mm -hmm. which is the most difficult thing. Yeah. You can't control that. Yeah. You can't just click a button and buy a buy into something. But if you invest in that and you really put your energy into that, and, and like I said, the team's focus within mm -hmm. that, then you start to cultivate this real authentic community that starts to um, really become your ambassadors. Yeah, absolutely. So how do we balance this authenticity, right? Like you have to be authentic, you have to be real. And Kristen was a great example of that, right? And the brand and the voice, and it all has to be real and authentic. But you also have to sell product. Like you have to ship, otherwise no amount of authenticity is going to save your business. How do you, Mara, how do you balance that at Pura, authenticity and shipping product? Be true. Tell the truth. And that's what we do. We're creating experiences for people. We're trying to get them to be able to customize and personalize mm. what they have in their home. And is that the tech behind it? That's the tech the behind it, but it's also the emotional connection yeah. with fragrance. You're going to hear me go back to it's that constantly. It's the human yeah, element. Yeah. I, have to, I have to pull this out of my pocket because I'm going to misquote uh, Maya Angelou. <laughs> and, and I want to make sure, because this is a wonderful quote, because it's the same thing. Because she said, at the end of the day, people won't remember you, what you said or did, but they will remember how you made them feel. I didn't Absolutely. want to misquote that. I love it. And it's beautiful mm -hmm. because that's exactly what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. If we don't believe in ourselves, nobody will believe us. This is the experience that we're trying to create. Pura, look at our name. Mm -hmm. Okay? You we get it right away. Right away. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, the values internally, we live by them. Okay. Our, our mission, our values internally, you guys will probably relate to this too. It's human, mm -hmm. it's uplifting, it's remarkable and simple. Yeah. That's very powerful, Beautiful. because if you do the top and the bottom, that's what it's all about. Yeah, amazing. Okay, so building these, or creating these craveable brands, and this emotion, and the connection, and the people behind all of that, um, it's hard to do, okay? There's lots of brands who try, there's lots of brands who fail, there's lots of brands that are more ops-based, and they don't quite bring in the brand, or invest in the brand, and that's, all, that's okay, they'll learn the next time, right? <laughs> Um, but what are some craveable brands for each of you? What brands do you respect? What do you look at and go, they are doing it, like they're crushing it? Mm -hmm. Jake, Ashley, Mara, let's go in that order. Yeah, I'm gonna make one point on the balance question because I think yeah. it's, a, it's a good one that I think I learned firsthand. Um, how do you balance kind of the desire for growth with, yeah. um, uh, with where your brand is at today, yep. right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think the investors in the room probably won't like this, but the reality is you balance that by moving at the speed at which your customer gives you permission to move. Mm, okay. Right? So it took, I mean, we My were- My customer, not retailer, your customer, the person putting it in their home and using yeah, it. Yeah, or, or re retailer to the customer, right? Mm. But I think so often, like we, we, we actually just nine years in raised our first institutional capital round, right? Wow. And I think if we would have done that in year one, we would have moved faster than our customer would have given us permission yeah. to move. Yeah. Um, so like that advi advice at times is like, slow down. Yeah, that's so interesting. And that's hear. okay, yeah. Oftentimes you're, you're talking with startups who are just trying to raise capital. Go, 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 grow, 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 yeah. right? Okay, so how did you balance? I mean, nine years in, and then congratulations on the raise, yeah. right? Just this week it was announced. Yeah. Very exciting. Well, I mean, as you know, three years to get to two employees. Yeah. Like that was the yeah. pace at, that was the pace at yeah. which it made sense for us to move. The market wasn't ready for us. Mm -hmm. And then once it was, once the flywheel was spinning, then you're like, okay, cool. Now, it's now we can throw a bunch of gas in this fire because yeah. it's lit. And you had the foundation. You had the business. You exactly. had the brand foundation exactly. to be able to grow. Otherwise, you can tend to trip over yourself a little yeah. bit. Okay. But brands I love. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I love the brand Blue Dot. It's a kind of modern contemporary furniture brand based out of Minneapolis. I'm from yeah. Minnesota. Um, beautiful design, approachable price points, um, delivered via a brand that has a real kind of sense of 
Minnesota nice meets kind yeah. of Minnesota quirky. Yeah, yeah, it totally is. <laughs> yeah. I, that does not surprise me at all, right? Because you think about the fellow brand, and it has there this is, little wink, I, this little like sarcasm almost. So one of the Blue Dot founders is now an, an advisor for us that I've, right. I've reached out, cold email anyone, and just be like, I love you and want to connect, and human ego will respond. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so he responded, um, and we've been good friends since. But oh, I remember great. on that first call, I'm just like, listen, I just love you so much. I'm doing a lot of yeah, stuff you're yeah, doing. That's great. Just did the kids. Is it John? Did John? Uh, or is it? John and Maurice. And yeah. Maurice. Oh, man. They're awesome. I love it. Very good. So, Blue Dot, Ashley. Um, you know, I, it's a toss up for me because I, as soon as you said that, I was like, citizenry has totally yes. come into and taken over my home, is the <laughs> truth. Um, I love the brand citizenry, citizenry, if you haven't looked at it, because they story yeah. tell about where they're. Um, you know, just where they're sourcing all of the products and mm -hmm. their quality. And I just love that connection and, and thinking about it global. So that's a big one for me. But I actually think probably the one that I'm in most awe of right now is, I'm guessing most of you will have not heard of this one, but is uh, Homefield. Tell us about Homefield. Okay, so Homefield yeah. is a vintage athletic apparel brand that oh, launched cool. a couple of years ago. Um, and basically what they do, like I just, I follow them on Twitter. I just uh, like, I love, again, the voice. I love the energy of what they're doing. But they basically reach out to uh, universities, and they get to go through the archives, and they find old logos, oh, wow. and or, or different things, mascot-related things, and then they bring forward, and they do these uh, Saturday. I think it's uh, they do drops on, on certain Saturdays. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm butchering what, how they call it, but it's uh, it's just the energy of it, the fun of it, mm -hmm. the community they're building. It's yeah. just fantastic. And yeah. you know, even though I'm far out of my college days, you can't <laughs> help but just go, oh, I want to be back in yes, that. And, yes. and they just have a wonderful spin on it. Um, right. And they're just absolutely exploding right now. So I think it's really fun Very to cool. watch as they're growing. Don't you love to see these like really crowded categories and then a different yes. position will come in that's unique and strong and then they'll just blow up and you didn't even know there was room in the category. You had no clue um, and I think that's really fun and, and I will say if you indulge me I did want to I had a thought on the balance thing too that yeah. I would just the only thing I would also add is um, as because I've been a part of kind of these companies especially as they started make sure that attention and, and put of staying small is the way that we think about it is like the bigger you get the smaller you need to stay but is bringing the people along in your company and don't forget how important it is for them to really understand the roots and and to grow and, and to come from that space because i think that's where some of the disconnect happens like yeah. your employees i've met people here in my time here and it's like the passion and the just it, just the feels that you get from everybody working mm -hmm. within as new people as you get bigger you bring new people in they don't get that luxury of having been there yeah. for that initial kind of early days stage so i think just finding your way to bring that in is also important because yeah it will be reflected in what you put out into the world. For sure, and it becomes increasingly challenged as the company yeah. grows, but even as a larger company, you can still go into an office or, or interview somewhere where you just feel that intangible excitement for the brand, yes. regardless of the size. Yes. That's pretty exciting, that's pretty yeah. special. Yeah, but home field, that's That's right, favorite. all right, so we got Blue Dot, home field, Mara. Well, I'm gonna be the outlier because I don't have a specific brand, okay. but I do love Blue Dot, by the way. Yes, right. But you know, one of the things that we talk about, for me personally, it's the brands with all of the above. Yeah. Something that really resonates with you emotionally. You know, we talk about a lot internally about the, the, the brand is the dam that holds back um, commoditization. Mm -hmm. So when you really think about that, you don't want to be like anybody else, but you're always going to have somebody out there that you're looking up to. For sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, that's, and that personally for me is what I, I gravitate to. great. Good. And the story, it's also the story. Yeah. I mean, going back with the balance and everything that we were talking about, the story has to resonate. Yeah, well that hook will obviously yeah. be one of the first reasons why we believe in something. Exactly. And then advocate for it once exactly. it becomes part of our lives. Yeah. Good, very good. Well, we want this time to be tactical. We want it to be helpful. So if everybody's okay, I'd love to open it up for yeah. Q and A yeah. for the next few minutes sure. and see if there's anything that these amazing marketers can do to help us. Any questions? Yep, right there, in the hat. Hello, thank you so much for your uh, information. I specifically wanted to ask a question about voice. Mm -hmm. So being uh, the co-founder of a startup, um, I've been able to recognize how much I'm limited. <laughs> you know, being in operations my entire career and then jumping into this new uh, and scary field that's called marketing is very hard for me. <laughs> um, but I'm a part of a community, the gut health community, 
And it's something I'm very passionate about myself, but the thing that I struggle with is knowing how to speak or, or the voice or the copy that's in, my, in my, my posts, in my communication with consumers. So how do you balance some of your own limitations as a founder uh, to be able to communicate and reach the consumer better? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a tricky one because, um, you know, I, I think I can relate to that and we all know what we think, but you're really trying to create the voice of the brand. And so I think there has to be also just consistency in what that looks like. Um, I don't know if you can do it, but I, I'm telling you, investing in a copywriter, not even full time, you can get amazing contractors. That's, that's what's really changed, I think, in the last, certainly the last couple of years. But I think that you know, there's so many creators out there. There's all kinds of networks that you can reach into. Um, I'm trying to think of the latest. I'm, I'm sure, Bo, you can recommend some too. But um, there's one that I, I, it's escaping me. I'll, it'll probably come to me after the, you know, I'm, the mic is not going. <laughs> Um, but I think that, you know, really, I, I would encourage leaning on a professional to help you just cultivate it because otherwise you're going to get, you're going to stumble. But it really is about making, um, I think, the consistency, consistency of the voice. Um, but that's also where when you get out and start hearing the way people talk, I mean, that's where I get a lot of my inspiration is, is just talking to people and, and hearing it back to me. Um, but I, I can't stress enough that copywriting actually, I think, is, is often undervalued uh, or underappreciated. I don't know. Yeah, I super know helpful. Totally. Thank you. Thank you. So to, to all of the questions, um, one of the coolest things that Stance ever did for us as a client is after we finished our first project, packaging project together, they made us custom enlisted next level shit socks, Stance <laughs> socks. And so these are super limited edition and I've got a few. So anybody who asks a good question gets a pair of socks and you do too. Yeah. So, um, so thank you for the question. We have another one yeah. right here in front. Hey there. Um, thank you so much for this. This has been really helpful and really informative. And I have a question specifically for Jake. So you've created the Stag Kettle, and I use that every day. I've been using it for years. All right. Awesome. Self-proclaimed coffee snob. It is quite a pretentious uh, <laughs> hobby. That's what we don't want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I love it, and I love sharing it, but it is sometimes hard for friends and family to get into it. I'm the only one who owns the kettle versus something like Sunbun, uh, Sunbum, where I was recently on vacation and we went through like six bottles um, while we were in Florida. So, you know, we go through that quite quickly, but with a kettle, I have, I don't imagine when I'll buy the next one because it's such a high quality pro uh, product. My question is, how do you try to reach that uh, market that doesn't know why they need a high quality tea and coffee kettle? Yeah, great question. I first want to repeat what you said like three minutes ago. The, the brand is the dam that holds back commoditization. Yeah. Like everyone should write that down. I, I'm name. like, <laughs> I try not, to, I just repeat it so I don't forget it, but I loved it. Um, I th to your question, I think this is probably goes back to just being okay with moving at the pace of your market. Right, like I'm not gonna convince my mom to make pour over coffee. I've given her everything that we've ever made and I go home and she has Folgers and a Mr. Coffee on, <laughs> on the countertop, right? So, and, 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 yeah. and that's okay, right? And I am creating a company, right? I am thinking through like my OpEx, my fundraising plan to match kind of the potential and speed at which the company is moving. Now, over time, yeah, we, there's a convenience quality trade-off in coffee. Like, we want to move more to convenience, and like that market size is going to grow as we move more to like the coffee curious customer. Um, but that's going to take time, and like a big learning for me over the ni last nine years is just like, that's okay. Yeah. Great question. All right, do we have one more right there in the back? Hi. Um, you kind of touched on this with like you'll get to those later adopter, like the, the coffee curious people later. Um, but, uh, well, first thing, do you guys like plants? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, give her, give her socks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, great. Uh, so my company, we're a complete plant care system and we have so many value props because 
we help you determine the health of your plants, and then we also do product delivery, and we're also completely sustainable, and we also do so many other things. And so when you're trying to consolidate your messaging, but so many things are resonating, resonating. Uh, how do you how do you do that? How do you achieve like consistency and simplicity when there's so much going on? Yeah. So how do you how do you refine and hone in on your definition? Yeah. Who wants to take that? This will be our last. Mara. Say Mara. Please. Yeah. Well, first of all, we love plants because plants are you know we we create from plants and everything. But it's I I think ask the question one more time. So when you have, and I think you're a good person to answer this, because yeah, yeah, yeah. Pura does have so many yes. different value props. Yes. So when you have so many different value props, how do you consolidate them into yeah. simplicity and consistency? Because they're all part of the format. They're all part of who we are as a company. It's what we represent. You know, like we always talk about the story is very, very important. But the story is not just about the ingredients, of course, that go into our fragrances. It's everything, everything that we do. So our value proposition that we're offering to our consumers, to our, even to our internal employees, you know what I mean, is all part of one big, powerful message. And that's what we do. And we live it every single day that we come into work, when we develop, when we come up with different iterations, like I said, of our devices, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we, this is the way that we operate. And it, again, you know, I brought up before about the, you know, the pure values. It's simple, but it's powerful. And it always needs to have that human element attached to it. Wonderful. Mara, Ashley, Jake, you're amazing. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Really.